Today we're talking to a person who is probably the most important guest we've had to date in terms of practical scientific implications. Before we get to the actual interview, I'd like to make two introductory comments. If you'd like to skip to the actual exchange, see the timeline in the video description. First, you'll see that Levin and I make reference to the physical foundations of his work. I'd like to elaborate on this, so on the screen I've inserted the formula for the so-called Hamiltonian of an open-ended relativistic string from string theory. In its Lagrangian form, this is the ultimate theoretical foundation for what Levin and I talk about as the principle of least action. Note that the energy of the string is quantized as m squared, or mass squared, which gives rise to a certain symmetry between physics at the most fundamental quantum level and the well-established classical physics that powers the bioelectrical engineering that Levin and his team are using to regenerate frog limbs. It's important to understand that this is not simply abstract math or philosophy, and the proof is in the pudding. Along the same lines, and following a line of reasoning that Levin refers to as the multi-scale competency architecture, here is the algorithm that we propose to apply these same physical and mathematical symmetries to social and economic systems, and voting theory in particular. Note the quadratic math and the symmetry present at each of Levin's so-called scales of intelligence, from fundamental physics to bioelectricity to a branch of economics known as social choice theory. At each one of these levels, the same framework delivers practical, real-world solutions to outstanding problems. For more information, I encourage you to go back to the channel's inaugural lecture for a first principles conceptual approach to the physical framework being proposed. That's one introductory comment. The second point I'd like to make is to ask you to pay special attention to Levin's goal-oriented approach to science. Despite the resistance of many to the idea that nature has purpose and goals, note Levin's extremely compelling response. He says, look, this is a framework that we find useful and the language we use to describe it. If you have something better, bring it. For the moment, my team and I are regenerating frog limbs and are looking to regenerate human limbs and organs, as well as possibly cure cancer. How is your framework and your teleophobia working out for you? This is such a great response and listeners may or may not recognize in it an echo of this channel's preference for Yakir Aharonov's two-time interpretation of quantum mechanics, wherein the future is posited to have a causal impact on the present. The point here is that in biology, as in physics and in society, the proof is and should always be in the pudding. Just as Levin and his team are doing in bioelectricity. Using Aharonov's two-time approach, many teams in many parts of the world have been able to respond in an intuitive and empirical way to several of the most perplexing open questions in science and philosophy. I'm happy to count ASIM among those teams. If any other framework can do better, I say what Levin and Aharonov say. Bring it and let's all learn together. Anyway, thank you for listening, and here, alas, is my exchange with Professor Michael Levin. It is a privilege to share it with you. Hello, and welcome to A Theory of Everything. I'm Luis Razo, the director of the European Institute of Science and Management. And today I have the privilege of talking to Professor Michael Levin, whose work I think you're going to find especially fascinating. Professor Levin has dual degrees in biology and computer science from Tufts University and a PhD from Harvard. He's currently a distinguished professor of biology at Tufts, where he's also the director of the Allen Discovery Center and the Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology. Despite his impressive academic pedigree, 
it's genuinely difficult to pin his work down to one or two disciplines. I would argue that he's doing important work at the cutting conceptual edge of things related to physics, biology, medicine, cellular robotics, computer science, artificial intelligence, psychology, management, politics, and philosophy. That's a lot of ground to cover, uh, of course, but all of these disciplines are of special interest to this channel, beginning with physics and going all the way up through the social sciences, which is why the channel is called a theory of everything, and which is why I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion. I'm guessing that Professor Levin is surprised by me including things like physics, psychology, politics, and management among the list of disciplines uh, impacted by his work. But I'm prepared to defend this position, and that's one of my primary <laughs> goals uh, in this exchange. In the interest of brevity and to make the most of our time together, I'm going to assume that listeners are already basically familiar with Professor Levin's work. He's given a wonderful TED Talk in which he summarizes some of his work in about 18 minutes. I'll leave a link to that talk um, and other discussions and relevant papers in the video description. I highly recommend listeners to spend some time with these materials to get a better feel for the far-reaching implications of today's discussion. Professor Levin, welcome, and thanks so much for taking the time to talk today. Thank you so much. Yeah, very happy to be here. Professor, one recurring idea in your work is a non-traditional conception of intelligence. And in fact, you cite the American philosopher and psychologist William James, his definition of intelligence. <clears throat> I had the privilege of studying intelligence under Richard Herrnstein at Harvard, uh, who had an office, in fact, in, in William James Hall. I grew quite fond of Professor Herrnstein and his willingness to help me. And I think his work is super important and relevant even today, 30 years after his passing. But at the same time, I was always left with a feeling that his conception of intelligence was limited and there was a higher form of intelligence. And that higher form of intelligence is, is, is something that I think your work is tapping into. Um, you say that when a person makes a judgment, this is very interesting. You say that when a person makes a judgment about intelligence, it's a measure of their own IQ. And I think you're absolutely right. Can you elaborate on this conception of intelligence and connect it to your work? Sure. Um, well, let, let's let's take a step back. So, so I want to be clear that intelligence is a really, as as you well know, is a very complex issue. Uh, I'm I'm not going to claim that I have the only appropriate definition or the best answer. I'm just going to give you my thoughts on it and the framework that I found useful in my work. And I think we, you know, can fully um, accept that there are other people with other useful definitions and so on. So for me, uh, some, some, something that's, uh, that has to, so some work that has to be done by any theory of intelligence is that it has to be able to help us uh, directly compare and interact with what we now call diverse intelligences. So I'm not interested in theories that apply just to mammals or to mammals and birds or that break down when we have to think about octopus or insects or other things I want. A, uh, a framework for intelligence that is going to handle all possible agents. This means not only the things we see in the uh, phylogenetic tree here on Earth, but novel synthetic, synthetic biology constructs, uh, artificial intelligences that we may build either in hardware or software, potential exobiological agents, weird uh, beings at other scales, including individual cells, subcellular molecular networks, uh, enormous things like um, uh, social structures and, uh, you know, um, ba basically, and, and perhaps the evolutionary process itself. So I, I want a definition of intelligence that captures what is central about uh, intelligence, that it does not uh, depend on or get hung up on implementation materials or origin, evolved, designed, you know, natural on earth, exoplanetary, I don't care. I think that, that right, if we're going to have intelligence, it's got to, uh, it's got to do with that, that much work for us. So uh, what that means is that um, 
we are guaranteed to, uh, by coming developments, let's say in synthetic uh, biology and AI and so on, we're guaranteed to encounter creatures that don't fit anywhere comfortably on the familiar scale of intelligence on Earth that we're used to. And so we don't know yet what are the appropriate uh, uh, signatures of different kinds of intelligence. And more fundamentally, I don't believe that there is some kind of objective privileged um, once and for all correct answer to how intelligent something is because all of these things intelligence cognition many other important concepts are basically observer dependent it's on it's on the observer to make a claim about intelligence and then to specify what space what problem space that intelligence is is de being deployed in what are the goals of that intelligence how much co competency it has and when you make those goals you put yourself out there as uh, for you for it to be evaluated yourself as in how well did you do? Did you, did you uh, uh, figure out what this being is capable of in, a, in an optimal way? Or maybe later someone else will come along and say, oh, you missed the boat entirely. Look at, look at what it's doing in this other space. It's way more intelligent than that. And so I see all of these things as empirical claims. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, as, as all empirical claims, they're provisional, they're sub subject to um, you know, uh, uh, up updating by other people who are sharper than we may be in noticing what it is that a certain system is doing. So that's what I mean. When you, when you make an IQ test, you're making a claim of, this is the way I've discovered to interact and to interpret the system. Show me if there's a better one or not, but that's, you know, that's, that's the current, that's my current estimate. That, that's what I meant. Okay. I really, really like this, this um, common response of yours is, is, this is my proposal. If you have something better, then show, show it to me and let's talk about it. Yeah. And it's the fact that you are so focused on empirical results, I think is, you know, it just, it just wins the day, right? It wins the day. So, so what is your definition of intelligence? So, so my definition of intelligence is is uh, a basically basically what William James said, maybe a little bit generalized. I I view intelligence as competency in navigating various spaces. These spaces can be all kinds of unconventional things. So not just the three dimensional space that we're used to, but also things like transcriptional spaces, meaning the space of all possible gene expression levels, anatomical morpha spaces, so basically the space of uh, uh, shape um, deformations and, and shapes, biological shapes, um, physiological spaces, it doesn't matter, it can be many, and there may be other spaces that I don't even know how to deal with, linguistic spaces and other things. Uh, it's competency navigating those spaces. Now, what does that mean? Let's unpack that. It means two things. I think fundamental, the one thing that is fundamental to all agents to in order to call somebody something an agent to be somewhere on this continuum of agency. I think what we're really talking about is different degrees of competency to pursue goals. There is some region of that space that you prefer to other regions of that space. There are certain states that you like better than other states, and you have some amount of capacity to get there now when from from other portions of the space now that may be extremely primitive meaning that you might be a bacteria and all you're doing is run and tumble and you really you know that's all you know about your space or you might be very sophisticated like a like a mammal or a, or a bird that has a um, a memory of the space and can sort of navigate it with planning and forward uh, you know uh, forward planning and things like that uh but but in between lie huge uh, lie a huge diversity of different navigation uh, policies for navigating that space. For example, how good are you at avoiding local minima? Do you have patience to back away from uh, a, a sort of direct line to your goal? If you know that if I go around temporarily, I'll go further, but but in the end, I'll do a better job. You know, do you have some? Do you have patience? Are you able to uh, remember where you've been and to and to represent where you're going? There's a, there's a huge diversity. So William James, I think, had it right on the money as he did with most things, which is that he said that it's the ability to get to the same goal by different means. So do you have the, and, and what kind of capacity do you have to achieve your same goal with, the, uh, you're being perturbed, you've been pushed to a different region of the space, you have been altered in some way, your environment has been altered, all kinds of things are happening. Can you still get to your goal or are you basically just a uh, sort of hardwired automaton that all it can do is, is follow the exact same steps every single time? So I, I like that definition. It's a, it's a functional definition. It's empirically tractable. It uh, helps us do new work in, and it prevents endless armchair um, arguments, philosophical arguments. We, you know, we make it an empirical question. Okay, fantastic. Well, 
in your in your speaking, you talk about intelligence and you connect it to goals. Now, goals are inextricably um, embedded in time. So, as a biologist, you face, from what I gather, quite a bit of resistance in talking about goals and time. Why do you think? Uh, where do you think this resistance comes from? And can you? Can you elaborate on this in your opinion? Sure. Um, yeah, I call it uh, I call it teleophobia. Uh, there is this uh, incredible resistance to to any kind of models or frameworks that that have to do with goals. And I think uh, the reason is this uh, in in the olden days, it, we where where we basically only had two go, go, there were only two kinds of objects in the world as far as we knew there was dumb matter which just sort of does what it does. And then there were humans that had goals, right? And that's, that's the sort of, the, that's it. That was the dichotomy and that's what we thought about. Now, if you live in that world, absolutely, when you do science, if, you, if those are your only two choices, when you do science, you want to err on the side of uh, no goals because otherwise you end up with, you know, completely um, scientifically intractable uh, kinds of uh, pseudo problems where, um, where you know attributing human level goals to to most of what we see is just is just useless so people are on the side of no goals at all now the the, the nice thing and, and and a lot of people seemingly haven't caught up to this is that ever since the 1940s and probably well before that we've had a perfectly good science of goals that is not magical okay the 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 age of having either no goals or or human level cognition those are your only options that age is gone since the 40s we've we've had we've had cybernetics we've had control theory we've had computer science we now know perfectly well that you can have mechanical non-magical naturalistic systems that have goals and uh and it's not scary there's no problem with it it's not religious it's uh you know your thermostat actually has goals that's that's we just have to bite the bullet and and go with the engineers on this one because it's been uh an incredibly uh useful framework for understanding the world so so at this point i i think i think the resistance is still when people hear goals they think um second order human level goals where i know what my goals are that's not that's not just a goal that's an incredibly complex piece of cognition that no one is attributing that to uh, the wide variety of objects that we deal with in biology but that's but that's not what goals have to be goals don't have to be this incredibly complicated modern human thing there are very simple tiny little goals and there are sort of slightly more complex goals and it's everywhere no, nothing in biology and this this sort of paraphrase is a, a famous old saying by uh, that's a, a, I think nothing in biology really makes sense in the absence of goal directedness. If, if you really want to understand biology, you have to make your peace with the fact that there are goals. There are, uh, in fact, a wide diversity of goals, and it doesn't have to be this, this binary choice between human level goals and no goals at all. That, that's what screws everybody up. Fantastic. And I always come back, or I like to come back to your position that, listen, this is my framework. If you have something better or, or more explanatory uh, or empirical evidence that, that surpasses what we're able to produce, then you know, bring it. Uh, so, so how would you characterize the current um, climate regarding uh, teleology in biology today? Is it, is this, is, does it remain the, the, the primary framework under which biologists work, the idea that there is no goals? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I want to sort of, sort of be clear. I, I'm not the first person to try to rehabilitate, uh, you know, a teleology in, in biology. There have been many very deep thinkers who have made these uh, this the, this effort from time to time. However, I think that uh, the field as a whole really, by 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 a very large amount, falls into two camps. There are people looking sort of downwards towards molecular biology and assuming that uh, the micro details of chemistry are going to do all the work that we need and that there should be no goal talk whatsoever that 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 that's a that's a massive uh, you know sort of slice of the of the pie then then there are the people who look at it uh, in reverse and they and these tend to be uh, maybe not not the developmental biologists but or molecular biologists but maybe um, people more interested in, in in psychology and behavioral science and maybe social issues who worry that that kind of uh, approach is going to drain 
um, is going to drain uh, humans of, of, of moral status that basically all, everything will then go out the window that, that once you once once other things besides humans have goals, then then we will have trouble with ethics frameworks and we will be devalued in some sense and they, you know, they're worried about the coming AIs and, and extending personhood to to things that they don't think are persons and so on. Um, and, and then there's a there's a kind of a razor thin community in between, which are people who work on basal cognition. And, and again, I'm not the only one. There are, there are a number of really excellent folks working in this area that work on basal cognition and uh, and and try to um, try to try to you know to to to, to expand uh, this 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 impasse. the the biggest uh, The biggest problem with all of this is this that that most of these discussions have been taking place in a philosophical vacuum. So a lot of the people who critique this topic have never read a single thing on teleology. They just know that that uh, the goal, they just feel that goals are bad. Um, often the people who are into this topic debate endlessly in philosophy and it, it, it never sort of impacts the other side of the community because what they want to see is all right, uh, what does this do for me? Why do I need to pay attention to this? What, what, what's the, you know, what's the payoff going to be? And so what we've done uh, is, is work very, very hard at trying to be extremely clear as to the idea that these, these concepts are not philosophy. They, are, they cannot be decided from an armchair. They literally make a difference in how you do experiments and what experiments you do. So to me, the, the final arbiter of all of this is simply, uh, well, what, what has it led? Yeah, it's experiment. It's what has this led you to do? How you know how how is the research program going? What has this right? That's that's to me the the trick. And so so we tried very hard to make that connection. That's great. So so you're saying essentially you're saying listen, I'm generating or uh, regenerating frog frog limbs. So what are you doing with your framework? No, I think that's. I think, yeah, I mean to some extent to to, to to some extent right. The idea is simply, and I've had people say to me, you know, I'll give a talk and somebody will say um. You know, uh, I really like your data. I like what you show. I wish you'd stop talking about this goal-directed stuff and and this basal cognition. I mean, just ditch that and just do the experiments. And and I always say it doesn't work like that. We wouldn't have done these experiments. And the reason that we did them and that nobody else had done them is precisely because we have a framework that leads us to ask these questions that other people either assume are solved or just you know won't won't touch at all. And uh, I think uh, there, there, there's lots of there's lots of work that really should be looked at. It's not not just me. There's lots of work that should be looked at um, from from that perspective. Excellent. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, of giving a talk this morning to a group of doctors here in Barcelona, and your work figured prominently in that. And one of the arguments that I put forward was this. Um, goal-directed orientation in biology actually had a, a parallel or a symmetry in physics mm. where things such as the principle of least action yes. Yes. also um, talks about the end uh, or, or a final condition, a boundary condition, the initial and the final boundary condition. Have you given a lot of, of thought to this, uh, to this idea and does it impact your work? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, that uh, least action principles are a uh, <clears throat> uh, massively important inspiration for me because it it bo it and, and I'm no I'm no physicist and and for you know for for a much better story about physics you can talk to um Carl Friston and Christopher Fields and then people I work with they're they're sort of much much sharper on this but uh, for for me it bears on the following question you know as I have as I have um, rolled out this framework of of a continuum of cognition uh, the question then arises is there a zero on this. So are there things that have exactly zero cognition? So none whatsoever, not just minimal cognition, not just simple cognition, but actually zero. And uh, because of these kind of least action uh, uh, principles, I, I think no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced, but if but if I had to put money down right now, I would say I think in our in our universe, I don't believe there's a zero because if you th if you sort of, so, so let's ask ourselves, what are the absolutely minimal requirements for having some some something that you would call being an agent right what are the absolutely minimal requirements well the minimal requirements to me are first of all that you are able to do some sort of goal directed activity as, as as simple as it may be but you're able to do some sort of goal directed activity and two there should be some degree of uh indeterminacy in your actions that are not precisely explained by all the local forces immediately acting on you now Okay. And if you think about it that way, 
Well, single particles already have it. We, we already have we already have the, the least action stuff. We have the quantum indeterminacy. I think it goes all the way down to the bottom. And so this is this is a, a weird kind of panpsychism in the sense that I'm certainly not saying that rocks have hopes and dreams like you and I do. What I'm saying, and I'm not painting some sort of extra mystical, um, uh, you know, cognitive shine on on physics. I think, and this is what Carl and Chris are both doing. I think that what we thought of as basic physics actually can and probably should be reformulated from this perspective so that it's not something weird and extra you sort of posit that's on, on top of on top of normal physics that works perfectly well that I think is, is is not useful. I think actually what what basic physics is telling us an active inference and then those kinds of things is that this stuff goes all the way to the bottom. And what life is really great at doing is scaling it, right? So, and and so and so, I don't work on really the physics, and I I kind of all my work starts up once once you have a a reasonably um, a sophisticated homeostatic uh, uh, creature. So even before bacteria, but something like that, um, then uh, then I, I talk about how it scales up. So I, I, I have lots of ideas about how that scales into higher and higher forms of cognition, but I think that's what life it's doing. It's not, it's not um, uh, generating it from scratch. I think it's scaling up something that is already in the bedrock of our universe. I would say that you're, you're probably right because the principle of least action, as far as we know, goes down to the, down to the quark level. And even in even in string theory, it's still mm. uh, something that, that uh, a, a framework that that governs the the thinking and the math. So I would, I would say so. Um, <clears throat> and what you talked about scaling up of this um, of these lower order principles and ideas. Can you elaborate on on that? How this scaling up from from physics to biology to perhaps other areas of uh, of human activity. Yeah, uh, the, this question of, of scaling and, and how you get emergent cognitive individuals or selves from a collection of pieces where the pieces themselves have some level of competency uh, is maybe the most important and the most interest to me anyway, the most interesting question in all of science. This is this is why my lab is hard to pin down why we do so many different weird things in computer science and biology, because ultimately we work on this very general question that transcends individual disciplines, this idea of how do composite minds come into being in the world? Because we are all collective intelligences, right? If you zoom in enough, there's no such thing as a unified uh, singular intelligence. Everything is made of parts. So at some point, you always have to understand how do the parts come together to form some sort of um, centralized intelligence. So, uh, you know, the, the, the best stories that I can tell, because these are empirically uh, uh, backed up stories, stories that are backed up by not only experiment, but actually applications towards regenerative medicine, cancer biology, and so on. The best story I can tell is what happens uh, once you have individual um, uh, homeostatic agents that are single cells. We, you know, let's say, let's say, let's say a very simple bacterial cell or even, even before that. The key thing about a homeostatic cycle is that it has three parts to it. You, you, you take a measurement of something you care about, let's say, the, let's say the pH, the local pH level or something like that. You compare that measurement with your set point, meaning the optimal, uh, the optimal measurement where it ought to be. And we can talk in a minute about where those optimalities come from. And then depending on what you find, you, you are not a passive observer like a piece of film, you are an active observer, meaning that you will do something based on that information. If it's too high or too low, you will take some sort of action to try to get back to it. So those are the three pieces of a, of a, of a homeostatic circuit. So now, once, once you are a cell like that, what you can imagine doing is, and, and we've, we've studied this, I don't study bacteria, but I study um, single you know, cells and, and tissues. What you can do is you can imagine the following scenario. Imagine that two cells uh, have now connected with each other and they've connected in a very special way. Not, they don't just send chemical signals to each other. That's, that's easy and that doesn't really do, do the trick. Uh, what they've done is they've connected to each other with a special kind of connection like a gap junction or an electrical synapse that co partially connects their internal milieus, their internal worlds, right? So they're like, like two submarine hatches connected to each other. That, some, something magical happens when you do that. What happens is this. Uh, let's say that's, let's say there's two cells, A and B, and let's say that cell A, uh, something happened to it, let's say it got poked by something in the environment and it generated a calcium flux or something that is a, it's an engram, uh, a memory trace of the experience that it's had. Well, if it's connected to other cells, let's say cell B, 
that calcium spike or, or whatever small molecule signal of that, of that memory is going to propagate into cell B. And now what's important is that, that there's no metadata on these signals that say where they came from. Cell B senses this, uh, this signal. And so for cell B, it becomes a false memory because cell B never experienced that event. However, for the composite of A and B together, it's absolutely a veridical memory. It's, tr it's a true memory. And because these memory traces can propagate between A and B, it becomes hard for the cells to keep their individual identities. It's hard to keep an individual identity. It's hard, hard to keep a dis difference between me and you if we share all our memories. If I can't say which memories are mine and which memories are yours, we become in an important functional sense entangled. That means that we cannot uh, easily defect from each other in the game theory sense of failure to cooperate we, we, because we're connected. If I do anything, it immediately, if I do anything to you, it immediately comes back to me through the gap junctions. So it makes it hard to defect. It, it makes our memories shared and it does three things to this homeostatic cycle. Whatever it is that we measure, we now measure a bigger space because now we're a whole sheet of cells. We're not a single cell. So when we take measurements, we take large scale measurements. So the thing we measure is bigger. We, our memory is bigger because now we have lots more computational capacity so we can remember bigger things as set points they're not just you know sort of small um, set points and the actions that we take are much bigger actions whereas before you were a single cell and you could do single cell things now we're a collective and when you do things you can do massive things like bend as a sheet and generate three-dimensional forms so what happens is that that scale that ability to scale up the goal directedness is the key to me, the, 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 the key driver of the scaling of intelligence, because here's my theory of, of uh, how you, comp how you um, uh, compare diverse intelligences. So how, how could you, and this was, this was something that uh, I was at a Templeton meeting, I think in uh, uh, 2018, I believe it was, where they challenged us to come up with a single framework on which you could directly compare diverse intelligences. And so what I thought of was this, uh, this idea that I call the cognitive light cone model. The idea is that every agent, I don't care where it comes from, I don't care how it got here, evolved, designed, combination, whatever, whatever it's made of, the fundamental thing to being an agent is that it has goals. So what we can do is we can plot on a, on a, on a sheet that looks, it looks kind of like a Minkowski diagram where all of space is sort of one axis and time is the other axis. You can plot on this, uh, on this, uh, on this, on this, on this uh, diagram, the size of the goals that that system is capable of representing, not how far it sees, not how far it can act, but, but the goals, the, the shape and, and size of the goals that it can pursue. So for example, you might have something like a, uh, like a bacterium and the bacterium, you know, it has a little bit of memory going backwards, a little bit of predictive capacity going forwards, but fundamentally all that it cares about that it's going to measure and control is things right around that bacteria, like, uh, you know, glucose concentrations and things like this. So there's a very, very tiny cognitive light cone and, and, and it just doesn't, it's it doesn't care about anything like that. If you have a more advanced creature, let's say you have a dog, much bigger cognitive light cone, it has the ability to, to, to remember and plan and pursue goals uh, in a bigger area, but you're never going to get your dog to uh, functionally care about something that will happen in the next town over three weeks from now. It's impossible. That go, that, right, that, as far as we know, that, that those animals just simply don't have that size of a light cone. Now you come to, to humans, humans have a massive light cone, and in fact, uh, uniquely perhaps, they have a cone that is, wi that is bigger than their own lifespan limit. So they can conceive of goals that are guaranteed not to be achievable in their lifetime. And that maybe that generates some special psychological pressures. I don't know. But but the, the idea, you know, there's people that are literally working towards world peace and they're you know, concerned with what happens when the sun burns out and these these kinds of things. So humans can have enormous um, uh, cognitive light cones. And so so what happens during the scaling from from the most humble bacteria up, what really happens is the enlargement of that cognitive light cone. What is what are the. Uh, what are the things that I can care about? And a very closely related uh, concept is the concept of stress. The stress being a, a, a variant of that delta, that error between where we are now and where we'd like to be. What is our goal state and how far away are we from that? And generally speaking, if you tell me what you're stressed about, I can tell you what your cognitive uh, level of sophistication is. So if you tell me that you're stressed, that your, your level of um, uh, you know, uh, sugar isn't high enough, I'll say, well, you're probably a bacterium. If you tell me that you're stressed because uh, you're, you don't have the right number of fingers, I'll say, well, you're probably a, 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 an actively regenerating limb. If you're stressed about the global financial markets and what happens in the next 200 years to humanity, I'm going to say you're at least a human uh, level of, of, of cognitive 
capacity. So, so the kinds of things that are capable of stressing you, right, are, are the things that deter, really determine what your cognitive uh, goal level is. And I think that's what gets scaled. What gets scaled is the ability to be stressed by bigger and bigger states of affairs. Interesting, very interesting point. Well, for whatever it's worth, one of the central um, uh, mission uh, objectives of the channel and our work at ASAM is to talk about some of the dangers that we're facing as a species, and that's one of our one of our main concerns. You talked previously about this optimality, and it reminded me of another framework that uh, comes from theoretical physics, and that's the the two time interpretation of Yakir Aharonov. Hmm. And what he, what he does is um, posit a different interpretation of physics especially the measurement problem in, in physics and how he resolves it in a very extremely rigorous and also empiri with empirical fruit um, is by positing that the future has an impact on the present. So that was, I think that's a, a very relevant point. And I would like to just remind listeners that this is something that is uh, very well-founded, not mainstream, but very well-founded, very solid from one of the most well-respected physicists uh, alive at the moment. So going back to this optimality, if we take that interpretation, is it possible that, op that that optimality that you referred to that seeks to reduce the stress between where something is at the moment and where that optimal set point is, can we understand that optimal set point to be in the future, anything other than in the future? Um, yeah, interesting question. So, so, so I don't know the, the physics work that you're talking about, so I, I'll have to, you know, re study up on that. So I, I won't comment on that in particular, but um, I think that uh, there's, there's the, the deep, the deep question that we're now asking is where do these goals come from, right? Where do these set points come from? So traditionally, there have been there have been two answers. So so one answer is when you are a human designer and you are creating some sort of structure, you as the designer set the goals for this thing, right? If you're making a thermostat, at some point you're going to have to set the value of whatever physical object that's using to store the set point. That's common the other, sense. No, sorry. That's common sense. No, right? To, to yeah. think of it this way. Yep, yep. So, so, so that's been that's been around for a long time. More, more recently, with with uh, you know with Darwin and all, we've realized that okay, evolution sets some of these set points. So your set point on a number of items is set to a certain level because in the past that's the set point that uh, has allowed uh, your ancestors to prosper. So that's the that's the that's the evolutionary definition. Now what we're seeing what we, so so now what we're seeing though is is something very interesting in terms of. Um, in terms of evolution, uh, e evolution apparently does not make solutions to specific problems, meaning a sp something that's fit for a specific environment. Evolution makes problem solving machines. And certainly people along for a long time have been talking about plasticity and epigenetics and things like that. But I think I think the reality is, is way more than uh, than what's been proposed up, up till now. I think that, uh, and I could give some some examples of what of what we've seen. Uh, but one of the interesting things there is that when you make novel creations, whether by chimeric technology, so bring together different uh, types of materials, bi biological cells and then genomes and other things that have never been together before, when you confront life with materials and and uh, active uh, matter and smart uh, electrodes and all these things that have never been around. Life is incredibly interoperable. Always you get something coherent and something interesting will happen. And then the question is, well, where do those goals come from? Because they are not the product of lengthy uh, periods of selection because this object has never existed before. So there's not been selection for this. And at the same time, it is not uh, the product of human design because it's self-assembling. You didn't, nobody designed it. It's it sort of self-assembled. So that raises an interesting question aside from a rational design and evolution and all the different mixes thereof, because these things now are being mixed by engineers all the time, the question, where else can goals come from? And that's, that's, that's an incredibly interesting question. Um, uh, if, if you want, I can, I can throw out some, some, some kind of wild ideas, but, but fundamentally, I think that's one of the most exciting open questions in the future is how, how do, and, and, and by the way, then to, to address your other point, this, 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 um, uh, 
hu human human thriving and 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 existential risks and things like this depend on the on us getting better at answering this question because right now we do not have a good science of predicting the goals the cognitive capacities and uh those kind of properties of emergent minds from their pieces we have no idea how to how to anticipate this none and but but we're creating these things all the time so we're creating internet of things and swarm robotics and social structures and financial structures we make these things all the time we haven't a clue as to what their uh, uh cognitive capacities are going to be and what their goals are going to be never mind to begin to actually manipulate them in a life positive way so that's that that question of where where do the goals of novel living uh, novel um cognitive agents come from is is a massively important thing for us to get a handle on very good thank you i i would i would argue or i would ask listeners to consider the possibility uh that aharnov uh, puts forth that the future has a causal impact on the present it seems like an intuitive possible response and his, his framework is rigorous, it's experimental, and it's very, very interesting. And I think I would argue that it has important um, implications for artificial intelligence and for how we organize ourselves politically and socially uh, as a species. With that, I'd like to ask about your work on artificial intelligence and uh, its impact on your ideas and your thinking, your experiments. Can you um, talk to us about that, please? Yeah, um, I, I'll, maybe I'll start by by giving some uh, fundamental um, uh, basics of how I think about these things, and then we can talk specifics. I, I don't like the distinction, I, I don't like the term artificial intelligence. And the reason I don't like it is because much like many other things in this field that I think we have to go and will not survive the next few decades, uh, it, it gives you the idea that there are two discrete kinds of intelligence. There's real actual intelligence, whatever that is. And then there's this artificial intelligence that in some sense is, is, is faking it or, or something like that. And and what I don't like about it is that uh, these these binary categories do, don't ca cannot hold, and the reason that they cannot hold is is for a couple of uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, we can make we 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 can make any sort of chimera that you want. So so people say all the time, machines can't do this, and and you know uh, uh, AIs can't do that, and and the, but the, you know but the humans can. They have the real whatever. Okay, we can make any kind of a compositional. Uh, agent that you want so we can and in fact we already have humans with various kinds of implants and they're driving wheelchairs with their mind and then soon the, you know they'll have access to information and other things uh you can make any sort of combination that you want that's some percentage human some percentage uh, design you know designed um electronics and and software and whatever and if you then are if you're still maintaining that there's some sort of sharp line to be drawn you're going to have these incredibly unsolvable arguments about exactly what kind of agent is in or out in your in your uh, you know sort of bubble of real real humans when the hum when a, when an inc when a massive variety of humans starts to show up with all kinds of different mixes between technology so I don't think I don't think it's 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 reasonable to try to paint some sort of a sharp line that that's first second I find that a lot of people have this belief that uh, humans are somehow or or you know other animals are somehow real and these things that we are making are less likely to be cognitive. And I find that very, very puzzling because if somebody said to me ahead of time, on the one hand, I have a project of uh, evolution, which is this basically random hill climbing search that's just as likely to increase uh, complexity as to decrease it at any given moment. And it's sort of like this, this, this uh, meandering search through fitness space, there's that. And then there's, and then there's rational design where a bunch of really smart um, engineers try actually try to build something that's intelligent which of those things is more likely to produce an intelligent agent i mean i i don't see any reason to say that evolutionary search is uh is is producing some kind of um especially blessed or stamped uh, uh, uh intelligent agent it seems to me that in the past that's where agents came from but that's i i see no reason to think that that's the best way to make agents um i think that it's a holdover really from a from a kind of pre-scientific religious view where where he, people thought that humans were created by God and therefore they're special and then humans aren't going to be able to duplicate that. We, that part is gone now. So we know that this is there's a naturalistic origin to, to, to life. 
And it seems to me inevitable that if, if, the, if the process of evolution can generate intelligence, so can engineers. Why? Because engineers can do both. They can use evolutionary te techniques when they want to, so evolutionary algorithms, and they have the benefit of much more rational design. So, so I don't see any a priori reason why artificial intelligence should be of a, you know, kind of a, a lesser kind in, in principle. Now, at the moment, I think the current, what, what passes for current AI is, is not capturing some of the uh, really critical aspects that it takes to be a, a, true, um, a true cognitive agent. However, uh, so, but, but, but we'll get there. I, I have no reason to think that we're not going to get there. I don't see why we wouldn't. I don't think there's anything that evolution can do that, that human engineers could not, uh, could not imitate in time. So, so we'll, we'll get there for sure. Okay, point taken about uh, artificial intelligence. I suppose I was referring to the, the current state of the art in computer science where, uh, or machine learning maybe is the better, the better term to use, where, uh, a machine learning model is, is prepared. It takes inputs, gives results. Those results are then fed back in and, and weighted differently uh, with the idea of getting an optimal yep. uh, result. No, yep. that's yep. the idea that I was referring to. So, gotcha. so this, this idea about the future um, and optimizing results through weighted input yeah, input with different weights attached to it. I th can we apply this idea to your work, especially your ideas about the future and where we're going? Because obviously humans are not gonna, going to agree about it, right? Um, technology already enables us to do things that some people don't agree with. So we have to decide somehow, we have to figure out a way of deciding how we're going to evolve. Right? Have you given much thought to this? And what are the implications of your work for that conflict between different conceptions of what people want from the future or what objectives people have? And this yeah. brings, in, in my view, brings your work, ties your work directly to things like social science and politics and voting theory. Have sure. you given much thought to this? I, I have, with the caveat that I'm certainly not an expert in politics or social theory or voting or any of that, but but I, I've certainly thought about it from from the perspective of our work. Uh, I, I am I am uh, not a great fan of uh, collectivist ideas about what what we should be without without minimizing the risks because I, I do th I do think there are significant risks, but without minimizing significant risk the the I, the importance of these risks, I think that. We have to keep uh, perspective. You know, the, the first guy, I remember this, uh, I read this story about the first guy to, I believe it's in London, to uh, come outside with an umbrella, right? And so he was basically, he was, he was mobbed uh, by, and, you know, and people threw rocks and, and so on, because this was an invention at the time that was considered unacceptable. How is it that he was the only one that wasn't going to get wet and it looks ridiculous and this and that, and, and, and people were very much against it. So uh, I, I think that uh, a healthy society uh, in, in many ways, and I think this resonates with, with current trends in, in, uh, in, the, in the world, uh, we, we, we have to be very careful with putting limitations on people. I think that everybody should have the opportunity to rise to their full potential. If that involves uh, swapping out your sense, senses and putting in implants and whatever it's going to be, it may, not, it may or may not match somebody else's idea of what a, what a, what a typical human should look like. I'm I, I'm not uh, into this idea of we all so, somehow have to agree on what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. We are, um, the, and, and the re and the reason is again in pre scientific times, there you could you could maintain this view that that God created what's natural, what we see. This is natural. God made it, and therefore this is the right way. And if you deviate from this, you're likely to cause a lot of problems. That's 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 a view. We no longer live in that world. What we see is that. There are massive problems. The current natural, quote unquote, natural state is not an ideal state by any means. Evolution does not optimize for happiness. It doesn't optimize for intelligence. It doesn't optimize for any of the values that, uh, that we care about. It optimizes for biomass. That's really all that evolution is optimizing for. And I, I think we can absolutely do better. And I think it's a moral, um, 
responsibility for us now that we have the capacity to guide what before was basically a meandering kind of random uh, search process. We now have the ability, uh, the ability to actually guide it towards life positive ends. So I think uh, the emphasis needs to be on uh, the protection of uh, the welfare of all kinds of sentient beings and on the freedom of those beings to express themselves to their full potential whatever whatever that may be so so i'm not i'm not really uh i'm not really supportive of of guarding some sort of a centralized um you know kind of agreed upon notion of of what a human is i think i think a human is basically a moral category it's not physical it's not based on physical uh properties it's not based on genetics it's it's a it's a it's a level of care and and concern about other beings and uh, and we are all going to be changing ourselves in many ways, as we already have the umbrella, glasses, uh, wheelchairs, crutches, uh, setting bones. You know, the first the first caveman to uh, you know to pick up a stick and do something with it that the others didn't know how to do. That's it. The race was on after that. So I I, I don't I, I think it's a losing proposition to try to limit people in how they're going to uh, express their life in this world. Yeah, good point. I think I, I would have to agree with that, especially on the, the freedom aspect. On the other hand, if, if you allow people to be free, which we should definitely do, does it stand to reason that some some actions will lead to greater well-being for those individuals choosing that freedom, and some may in fact prosper, while others will or may uh, cease to exist? Is that a possibility? Well, I, I'm not going to claim that uh, I have the solution to the oldest uh, sort of problem of mankind, which is how to, uh, how, to, how, to, how to arrange a happy life for absolutely everybody, right? So, so the last thing I would do is uh, claim a solution to that. I don't have a solution to that. Um, however, uh, for my admittedly amateur uh, observations of history, when one looks at uh, policies aimed to, uh, to, 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 to suppress uh, uh, freedom and advancement, in the in the hopes of um, uh, uh, keeping uh, sort sort of the bottom of the scale propped up, uh, to to me those those attempts have gone have ended very poorly. And uh, you know I, I I was born in in, in the USSR. Um, I lived I've lived there. Uh, not a great fan of of those kind of approaches. And so. I, I think that I, I don't have an answer for in, for for inequality. I, I, I've never heard of a scheme that is uh, reasonably uh, expected to do away with inequality. I don't think that 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 may be impossible uh, at some point. But uh, but I think the only thing to do is to help uh, is to is to let everyone do the best they can and establish policies for helping everybody to do what they can. Are there going to be are there going to be individuals that make uh, uh, harmful choices for themselves? Undoubtedly. And, and I don't have a great solution that preserves our, our freedom while making sure that nobody makes bad choices. I'm, I'm not sure that's even possible. Yeah, good points. You raise um, as a as a final uh, stretch of the conversation. I'd like to turn to a concept that you raise. It's tied to, to what we've just talked about, I think. Uh, you talk about how cells uh, cooperate. It's also related to the to your conception of intelligence and scaling of intelligence. You, you talk about how cells cooperate, but also how they compete. So this competitive cooperation and the math that's behind it, because a lot, a lot of your work is focused on bioelectricity. And at the most fundamental level, what governs bioelectricity is Coulomb's law no? and the inverse square law. So this math that's that's at the core of your of your work and your research. So let me think again of what my what my point my question is. The, the math that you're working on with bioelectricity and competitive cooperation. So we've just said that we don't we can't think of a way of balancing freedom, equality, et cetera. Do you think it's promising to look at the math of the work that you're doing, and especially this competitive cooperation and the mathematics of bioelectricity? Do you think that might be promising to, to research? I'm I'm not sure there's a direct link from the from the math itself. Maybe I, I'm not sure. What I do think is the case is that we can learn a lot about how large scale structures deform the action space for their parts. So 
uh, we've done some work, and this is not published, so, so you wouldn't have seen it yet, but we've done some work on how evolutionary uh, forces uh, impose artificial competition and scarcity on even the parts of one body, you know, the, the competition between cells in the same body. And so to the extent that we learn which kinds of larger scale structures uh, achieve their goals by pitting their parts against each other in various ways, we may get a little bit wiser in uh, making choices about what larger scale social structures we set up for ourselves and uh, you know and, and and for the community i think that drawing direct comparisons is very dangerous uh, as we know from from people who have tried to draw those comparisons from evolutionary theory right to try to base some kind of social policy on a misunderstanding of uh, of, of what evolutionary dynamics are doing um, so, so you know, my story, and, and I, people have asked me this question, okay, I, I, I tell this story of cellular uh, cooperation and the wiping of identity, and so they sort of uh, go uh, scale up and are, are able to achieve these of tremendous larger scale goals that single cells can't do. And so people say, okay, so should, does that then mean that we should all be connected to each other and our identities partially wiped uh, the way that cells do? I, I don't think that's the case either, because there's no guarantee that the higher level system has your uh, your welfare in mind. So when you go, let's say, uh, the, the, when you go rock climbing and you sort of rub all the skin off of your fingers, you have a, you as a larger scale system have a great time and you've achieved some goals and you're very happy about it. The, the, you, you've spent exactly zero time bemoaning the loss of these individual cells that were part of your organism. And so I think we need to keep in mind that these higher uh, these higher levels don't necessarily preserve the welfare of of the of the parts so it's very dangerous to just say okay we're going to sort of collectivize ourselves into this massive uh, central intelligence and then life will be good it, uh, what, what it what it does suggest is that we need a better understanding of the scaling policies so that maybe somewhere in there is a policy that optimizes some sort of a a, a trade-off that that we would like that we would enjoy uh, between the the benefits of being a collective intelligence and the um a kind of a focus on on the welfare of the individuals. So so maybe there's a good policy there. It's certainly uh, not I you know not something that we've already claimed to to establish, but it should be sought for. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Well, a, a very quick personal plug. I've written a book called Competitive Cooperation, where I mm. where I make this argument where I think we can get the benefits of um, both uh, individualism and capitalism. And the benefits of cooperation and collectivism while protecting us simultaneously from from either one and i use the 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 physics and the math that you're working with the coulomb's law and the inverse square law so hmm. um just a, a, a very a very quick plug-in for for listeners um excellent um professor i want to be respectful of your time can you tell us uh, what we can expect from, from you, what you're working on and, and what you'd like to do with some of your company? How are your companies doing? Do you, have, do you plan to bring uh, this technology to Europe anytime soon, et cetera? Uh, yeah, um, well, let's see. Uh, there, there are there are two companies right now. There's a company called Morphoceuticals Inc., which is uh, all about the use of uh, manipulating bioelectrical information processing for regeneration, in particular for limb regeneration and other organ repair. There's another company called Fauna Systems, which is all about uh, biorobotics and uh, creating uh, synthetic living machines out of skin cells that will do various useful things and teach us about uh, morphogenesis. And so uh, th those companies are, are doing fine, but it's extremely early days. We're basically just starting at this point. Uh, so I'm, I certainly hope they will be active in Europe as well. Uh, right now they're based in the, in the US, again, just, just starting days. And yeah, my group is doing all sorts of things uh, from the sort of conceptual, trying to develop these conceptual frameworks of how to understand um, uh, the, all the questions that we were dealing with today and how to drive those conceptual frameworks into uh, predictive algorithms that would help us to design better, better bots, uh, achieve regenerative medicine, fix birth defects, all, all these kinds of things. So, you know, we, we have applications in the areas of cancer and, and, uh, uh, regenerative repair and, and, and those kinds of things. So yeah, stay tuned. There's hopefully lots more, lots more coming this year. And after that, can you state quickly the, your, your website and, and your information where you, where you gather it? Yeah, you can find all of this stuff is on my website. It's uh, uh, drmichaellevin.org, one word, drmichaellevin.org. And uh, I also have a Twitter presence at, uh, at drmichaellevin. 
Fantastic. Well, uh, Professor, thank you so much for this conversation. Like I said, I think your work is just uh, absolutely fascinating and important. Thank you for sharing some of that with us today. And best of luck in your in your continued work. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was a great, great conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you.